Hi, everyone. So we're continuing with the British literature curriculum in a chronological order. So we're moving from the Anglo-Saxons and Old English into Middle English and the Middle Ages. OK, so just a quick review. The Iberians inhabited the island of Great Britain first. OK, and then the Celts came and they invaded and they lived on the isle and they left their culture and their stories and their ideas and then of course the romans came and the romans left infrastructure and they left all sorts of cultural values and ideas um however they kind of had to get back home because they had an emergency so they ended up leaving um but then not too long after we have the anglo-saxons who came and the vikings and we know that Beowulf was an Anglo-Saxon epic poem that had been reiterated throughout this culture, okay? So, you know, this is an Anglo-Saxon, what an Anglo-Saxon might have looked like, and this is going to start to take a little bit of a, a shift in this next unit. J.R. Lander says, Anglo-Saxon England was born of warfare, remained forever a military society, and came to its end in battle. What does this tell us about Anglo-Saxon England? Ultimately, it tells us that they were a very violent culture, and perhaps they had to be, right? There wasn't much civilization. There wasn't much order um, and structure yet, but that's all going to change. Here comes the Normans. Some of you might know where Normandy is, um, if not, I want you thinking about it. Where do you think Normandy is? So obviously these are the next people who invade the Isles. So, um, right, this is the Isle of Great Britain. Who do you think the Normans are? And what do you think the impact is that they have on this Isle? Obviously all of these groups of people left important cultural values behind and that has become what we know today to be England but we've also come from England so these are really our roots too um, and so we're moving into as I said the middle ages within Ireland England and Scotland this begins the middle ages age, ages begin in 1066 this is a very important start date I want you to remember this date 1066 and I'm going to tell you more about that date in just a moment and it ends around 1485. C.S. Lewis, you might have heard of him before. He was an expert on the Middle Ages. So he loved studying the Middle Ages. And I actually kind of do too. So I understand his fascination with the culture. You might better know him as the author of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which you may have read or even seen. Um, you may have read or seen Narnia, which he is also the author of. Um, C.S. Lewis, who again is an expert on the Middle Ages, gives us this quote, which reveals a lot about medieval society and the medieval man. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it, and I want you to see what this tells us about Anglos, um, not anglo saxon middle, the middle um, medieval people. Okay, so again, we're moving from Anglo-Saxon period into the Middle Ages. At his most characteristic, medieval man was not a dreamer nor a wanderer. He was an organizer, a codifier, a builder of systems. He wanted a place for everything and everything in the right place. Distinction, definition, tabulation were his delight. Though full of turbulent activities, he was equally full of an impulse to formalize them. War was, in intention, formalized by the art of heraldry and the rules of chivalry sexual passion in intention by the elaborate code of love. There was nothing which medieval people liked better or did better than sorting out and tidying up. Of all our modern inventions, I suspect that they would most have admired the card index. Those of you that do not know what a card index is, probably most of you, um, a card index was found in a library. Even, you know, Miss Tanella didn't have electronic databases in libraries when I was doing research papers in high school. In fact, I used a card index. So I would go to this card index catalog, kind of looked like um, drawers, you know, an armoire or something, and you would pull out these little 
draws and there would be all these cards in it and you have to sit through all the cards that were in alphabetical order in order to find the book that you were looking for. And this was their way of organizing things. So the Norman conquest, again, we're talking about the Normans coming and, you know, essentially conquering the Anglo-Saxons, okay? The Middle Ages begin after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Remember, I told you that date is really important. This battle, which took place in a single day, forever altered the course of history. How did the Norman conquest begin? Well, I'm going to give you a very informal colloquial history lesson here. So you can see here we have England, which was still ruled by the Anglo-Saxons in, 10, in 1066, okay? And here we have Normandy, France, okay? Over in England here, we have King Edward the Confessor, okay? He is an Anglo-Saxon king. He dies without children in early 1066. So usually you would pass the, the crown down to your children, but he doesn't have any children. And so everyone's saying, you know, where does this crown go? The very next day, King Harold of Essex wears the, the crown. They name him, they give him the crown and they say, okay, you are now king of England. Well, this causes some problems because apparently before King Edward died, he promised his cousin, William the Conqueror, okay, the, the crown. So even though William the Conqueror was not from England, he was from France, he apparently was promised the throne. So just to reiterate, the Norman invasion begins with the Battle of Hastings in 1066. We have Edward the Confessor, who is the last Anglo-Saxon king. He dies childless. The crown goes to King Harold. Earl of Wessex the next day. William the Conqueror gets word of this and he's angry because, hey, I was promised the throne. That, that crown is mine. Okay. So what does any person do? They fight, right? They invade. So he goes and he sails the English Channel. Okay. And he conquers the Anglo-Saxons. So here, Morris Bishop tells us that October 14th, 1066 was one of the decisive days in history. The battle itself was nip and tuck. The shift, only a few elements here and there, a gift of good luck could have given the victory to the Anglo-Saxons. If Harold had won at Hastings and had survived, William would have had no choice but to renounce his adventure. There is little likelihood that anyone would have attempted a serious invasion of England during the next millennium, by water at least. England would have strengthened its bonds with Scandinavia while remaining distrustful of the Western continent, even more distrustful than it is today. The native Anglo-Saxon culture would have developed in unimaginable ways, and William the Conqueror would be dimly known in history only as William the Bastard. Remember, William, as it says in the last slide, I may not have said it, but he was the illegitimate child um, of, King, in, of King Edward's uh, father, I think. And that's why they were cousins. Okay. Um, okay. So moving right along here, again, this, this battle happened in one day. Okay. He conquers the Anglo-Saxons. He defeats them. He does not eliminate them and kill them all off. Okay. As a result of that, today, English, and then so there too, you know, American, Language and culture combine both Norman and Anglo-Saxon elements, that is both French and German elements. If you ever look up our vocabulary words and you click the little arrow that goes down, you'll see that most of our words come from either French or German. Sometimes a little bit of Latin as well, okay? But this is a very important, you know, event that changes the course of the English language, okay? So I have some links on here. I am not able to play them in this video for you. So I've uh, hyperlinked them into the document that you will be completing for me for today. So I'd like you to watch this middle one where it says there's a French narrator. I am going to warn you, it's a little strange. He's kind of like, ah, ha, 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 like he does these weird French things. Um, nevertheless, it is a very good video. It's a very helpful video. Okay. 
William the Conqueror brings with him some important things that change England, okay? One of them is the this administrative accomplishment called the Doomsday Book, okay? It's an inventory of nearly every piece of property in England, land, cattle, buildings, fish ponds, okay? Every single thing in England is written down into this book. And this is an actual picture of the Doomsday Book, which is on display at Public Record Office in Chancery Lane, London. Okay, so you can actually look at this book, which was, again, created in like, you know, ten, late 10 hundreds, okay? For the first time in English history, people could be taxed based on what they owned. So people probably weren't too keen on the fact that the government, right, because essentially that's what he was at the time, even if he didn't, call, if people didn't call him that. Um, but at this point in time, people now had to tell someone what they owned, right? Up until this point, that was not the case. Again, middle evil people really like to organize things. And I think that putting everything down into a book is obviously um, supporting that idea that they like to organize things. Anyway, William the Conqueror remained powerful in Normandy. That means back in France, he still had power. However, he divided the holdings of the fallen English landowners among his friends and became King of England. So he brought change to England and it started to look more like what it does today. Okay, so Norman's impact on Anglo-Saxons. Obviously, the first one is, I want you to think about it, language, right? It brings French to the otherwise Germanic language, okay? William the Conqueror, right? He brings administrative abilities, the Doomsday Book. Okay. He also brings cultural unity. Okay. So um, he, again, is ruling the Anglo-Saxons and he is forcing them to um, mix into now the Norman culture. And so everybody starts to be culturally unified. All right. He brings law and order. Again, that medieval idea that they like to characterize, there's much more civilization now. Back in the Anglo-Saxons, when Beowulf was being told, there was a lot of, you know, um, savagery and brutality. Okay, there is still those things that exist in the Middle Ages, don't get me wrong. However, now there's rules surrounding all of these things. Okay, and of course, I would say uh, the next most important thing that we're going to talk about is this new social system called feudalism. You may have studied this in history class in the past or even more recently, um, but basically remember that hierarchy. Feudalism or the feudal system is a system of government in which less powerful people promise loyalty to more powerful ones in return for protection from barbarians, right? At the time, you know, everybody was kind of invading one another and a lot of violence. And so feudalism kind of uh, puts an end to that and it creates civilization, right? These peasants promise loyalty to the knights who promise loyalty to the nobles and to the vassals and the barons and the king. And at the very top, which is not pictured here, we have what? Who do you think is at the top of this hierarchy during the Middle Ages? Of course, God, okay? They were a very religious um, society, right? And, and divine right placed God at the very top. All right, so we're gonna start class tomorrow by watching this video on feudalism, which will tell us a little bit more about feudalism, um, but that is enough for today. So I'd like you to just complete the guided notes and uh, you will be given a little comprehension check tomorrow and we will continue with uh, this PowerPoint together as a class tomorrow, okay?